Cool. The arrow is in the right direction. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Walter Heck. Um, I'm uh, talking about uh, using Puppet in a traditional enterprise. Um, so uh, the, the subtitle says, uh, don't say DevOps. Uh, the idea was uh, that in that uh, environment, we slowly implemented all the things that uh, DevOps kind of does. But uh, they didn't want to use the term DevOps because it was too uh, modern and uh, uh, new for them. So then we don't call it DevOps, also fine. Uh, who am I? My name is uh, Walter Heck. I'm a CTO of Olin Data, and um, we, we are uh, uh, doing a lot of Puppet stuff, and uh, this talk is uh, to uh, explain to you one of the projects that we did last year. Um, so the company, uh, the specific company name I won't reveal, um, because they're not because I don't want to, but there isn't really any need. Uh, I gave the same talk in, uh, um, in FOSDEM uh, this year, and after the talk, four people came to me with individual company names and said, is it that company? No. Uh, so the things that, are, uh, th that we've noticed uh, are uh, pretty common across the uh, uh, enterprise uh, environment. So all you need to know is that it's a, a, a large managed hosting uh, provider in, uh, uh, in Holland, and um, uh, they uh, were of the traditional kind. And when I say traditional, I mean silos everywhere. Um, there was a monitoring department that I have never spoken to a single person who actually works in the monitoring team, because every communication went through uh, ServiceNow tickets, uh, which is sub-ideal if you want to figure out how to get a server automatically monitored. So in total, I spent about two weeks uh, hunting down how a server would, uh, in a normal situation with them, get back up, uh, backed up and monitored, which is obviously not really what you want to do. Uh, another example was uh, at some point we, uh, uh, we decided that uh, um, because we're puppetizing everything, it means that you're putting all the configuration in a central location. So we wanted to uh, talk to the security team and, uh, and get a, um, uh, recommendations from them and see what was the, the security uh, policy. Um, it took a week and a half to hunt down the official security policy. And then uh, in there it said, uh, you are not allowed to store passwords or any sensitive data in a reversible way. So you, can, you have to encrypt it in a way that it's not decryptable. But that's really great. With Puppet, that's exactly not what you can do because you need it to be uh, decryptable. So those kind of uh, things happened left and right. Um, the uh, environments that we were uh, uh, looking at was pretty much everything. I, uh, in the first few days, I asked a few times, hey, do you have any... Oracle, or do you have any uh, 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 Windows 2000, or do you have any this or that? They said, Walter, you can stop asking. We have 15,000 servers. We have every combination of software that can possibly run, and it's all still running. So um, yeah. While I was there, they phased out a network uh, with a name of a company that was acquired in the year 1999. And that network was uh, turned off last year. So. Bits and pieces of legacy. Um, the servers, uh, 15,000 servers, uh, around uh, 200 clients managed by about 20 teams. So a lot of these were, about 70% of these were, uh, were Windows servers, and a lot of it was uh, Snowflakes. All very uniquely crafted servers that had been set up at some point in the last five years, usually. Um, where nobody really knew why it was set up the way it was. And you know, when you want to start puppetizing a, a, such an infrastructure, you want to generalize as much as you can so that only the things that need to be unique in, uh, uh, in servers will be unique. And um, yeah, that was a bit of a challenge uh, because uh, very often there would be a, a technical application manager who would do a whole bunch of things. And one of the things that he would do in a day was uh, sometimes adjust a, a configuration setting. So it's tricky to, uh, uh, to get these people to uh, uh, adopt something like Puppet and try and de-snowflake their, uh, their snowflakes. So that was a, a good challenge. Um, so lots of really sensitive engineers. It's also not uh, something very unique. I've seen, uh, uh, um, so one of the things that I do is I give puppet training. And I had a, a group of uh, uh, trainees from that uh, company. And uh, one of the guys was a, uh, 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 or 
a number of them were uh, Windows uh, admins, and they were not happy at all. So uh, one of them, uh, before I even took my code off, basically, he was already complaining and uh, 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 saying that he didn't want to do all this Linuxy stuff, and uh, he didn't feel like it at all. And on the second day, in the middle of the uh, 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 training, he stood up. Apparently, he had been making himself really angry, so he stood up and he said, I will not have any of this, and he walked out and went home. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've given maybe, I don't know, 50 puppet trainings, and I've never, ever seen anything like that. But, yeah, that was an interesting experience. Um, on the customer side, <laughs> um, what happened was that there was a lag in uh, how to say that, receiving the things that they would ask for. So they would ask for a new application server or a, an update of software or whatever, and it would take weeks or months to get uh, the, the things that they, wanted to, uh, that they wanted to achieve. And on top of that, for a managed hosting server, uh, so, uh, for a managed hosting provider these days, uh, um, people are hearing stories from others where in Amazon you can do this in two seconds. Uh, Obviously, if you have a snowflake that has a, a super uh, specific configuration of software uh, uh, in it, that's a completely different story than uh, spinning up a new host in Amazon. But most customers don't necessarily have the technical ability to understand the difference there. So lots of these. Um, so why they chose uh, Puppet for this uh, project. Um, they did a, uh, first they did a proof of concept because uh, uh, of these 15,000 servers, about 70% was uh, Windows servers, which uh, uh, is the largest Windows project I have personally heard of. Um, but they, they had some uh, Linux departments that started using Puppet and were very happy. And then they did a proof of concept on, uh, uh, on Windows and that worked out quite well uh, as well. Um, as for why Puppet and not Tool XYZ, uh, I think that for these kind of really large environments at the moment, uh, Puppet provides the enterprise uh, um, capabilities that uh, not many of the other tools uh, actually uh, uh, provide. So it, they evaluated other tools, but none of them really came any close at that time. Um, so who, what, and how much? Uh, they had about, uh, as I said, 15,000 servers. We were a infrastructure team when I came in. Uh, I was one of one and a half people assigned to building the Puppet infrastructure. Um, and about, uh, over time, between four and 12 people building Puppet modules. Um, I wouldn't... So normally you wouldn't want to have a separate team building Puppet modules. If you're going to adopt Puppet in a large enterprise, you would want to have um, uh, Puppet modules built by the people that actually need them, so they have the capabilities that they are actually requesting. Uh, it's really cool if you build a, uh, um, I don't know, a, a Windows uh, desktop module that can manage people's desktops, but if nobody needs it, or it manages the wrong things, then you get an endless back and forth uh, between uh, the builders of the module and the actual users of uh, what uh, the capabilities of that module should be. So, but at the same time, they did an uh, inventory of uh, which modules they would need um, before the project started, and they came up with a list of about 140, 160 modules, um, which, because of the Windows environment, most of them either didn't exist or existed in pretty poor condition. Um, so they got a team to start building these modules uh, so that they could be put into uh, initial uh, production. Um, and besides that, there was about uh, uh, three or four people helping the customer teams uh, uh, roll out uh, uh, Puppet on their environments. Um, so. There was a Puppet team that was building the Puppet infrastructure to be used by each team, uh, and uh, each team then needed to be on onto, onto Puppet. Am I losing myself? Yeah. Um, so the tool set chosen, uh, when I came in, there was a, uh, uh, a Garrett uh, setup that had been set up by someone who left 
uh, two weeks after, so before I was fully aware of how things were uh, done, um, that person left. And since there was not really much documentation on what he set up and how, um, that became a bit of a difficult situation. Um, eventually, we, uh, we migrated to uh, GitHub Enterprise, uh, which um, I am not a fan of uh, proprietary enterprise software, but uh, GitHub Enterprise really, for such a large environment where you're basically building an open source community inside a single enterprise, uh, is great. Uh, GitLab, of course, is the, uh, is the other uh, tool that really, uh, really helps. Um, Besides that, there was a, uh, an ongoing effort to set up uh, Jenkins and get it to uh, uh, run tests, but um, I got really turned off with uh, Jenkins. I spent personally about a month trying to get it all to work, and um, the problem was that with Jenkins, it has 700 plugins that you need before it starts working, and then you change one setting, and the whole thing stops working, and you have no idea why, and it's all point and click, so not in a... Um, uh, not a success, but eventually it uh, it got uh, it, it was working. Um, the other thing that they uh, wanted was to puppetize Jenkins as itself as well, and um, I don't know if anybody of you ever tried doing that, but it's a complete nightmare. Um, Jenkins uses these XML uh, um, configuration files, and in order to uh, puppetize them, you first have to click around in the GUI to make the changes. Then you uh, look into all the plugins config files to see what actually changed, and then you puppetize those changes. Um, not a very pretty uh, process. Um, so the original plan and what, me, what got me really interested in this environment was that they wanted to have what they called a puppet king. And the idea was that all of these uh, different departments needed uh, puppet ins installations with a puppet master and a puppet DB, etc. Um, so we thought, let's or not, we thought. When I came in, there was a design that said, let's build a central uh, puppet master that manages all the other puppet masters. Um, we had it working in a proof of concept, um, but then, unfortunately, uh, that didn't work out so well. Um, I'll tell you in a, in a second uh, why. Um, obviously, um, when these kind of large environments are um, sold to management, um, there are very pretty stories of uh, when this is done, you will have a single button and you push it and uh, magically uh, all your servers are managed and uh, you can uh, spin up new machines, no problem, it's all good. While that is theoretically possible, uh, I've seen very few environments where that is actually possible and especially not these uh, enterprise environments where there's snowflakes left and right. So I think that that was a bit of an uh, uh, oversell uh, which made it then quite difficult for the um, engineers to um, live up to the expectations that were set by the uh, by management. So that was a, a challenge. Um, originally, the idea was to control everything from the central puppet team. Um, this was uh, something that was there before I came in, and one of the first uh, battles I had to have was to not want to control everything, because it's a horrible idea. Um, you have 20 customer teams that want to make changes and want to make uh, uh, adjustments to, uh, to their uh, infrastructure. There shouldn't be a central team overseeing all of these changes. Um, so the original plan was that in order for any puppet, chain, puppet code change to go live on a puppet master by a uh, team, it would have to be um, uh, approved by the central puppet team. And they did this uh, thinking that the customer teams didn't have any puppet knowledge and the central team did, so that was a good idea, but uh, luckily we managed to talk them out of it. It's a scary uh, step to give people autonomy, um, but it's really the only way this is going to work uh, in a larger environment. So I told you the story about the Puppet King. Um, unfortunately, uh, it turned out that uh, once we uh, had a, a pretty serious proof of concept working, um, I had a, so they were using Puppet Enterprise, and I had a question to the uh, support desk, and they said, oh, you're doing what? No, no, that's absolutely not supported. And um, the funny thing is that this was looked over by pre-sales guys, um, 
and approved. So that was four months of engineering down the drain, um, which didn't make me ecstatically happy. But in hindsight, it was a good idea. The reason, uh, or the problem, the big problem with uh, um, uh, uh, having a puppet master that manages all other puppet masters is that um, the SSL certificates get really tricky. Because normally on a puppet master, there is also a puppet agent. And that puppet agent has certificates signed by itself, um, by the master itself. But if you do a, a setup like this, you will have certificates that are signed by the master of that master. Uh, and the uh, uh, puppet is not really well equipped to handle such a scenario. So it becomes a bit of a SSL certificate nightmare. Um, so in hindsight, it was a, uh, a good decision to uh, step away from that. Um, when we started, uh, I think the first two weeks, uh, I spent probably about seven days uh, discussing things with people because uh, I was the first person with serious uh, puppet skills. Before that, people had played around, but not really in uh, large production environments. So I was, uh, how to say that, covered with people uh, asking me left and right, how do we do this and how should that be done? And there was large questions that were as of yet unsolved. And uh, after two weeks, we uh, sat down and we said, okay, the, um, the, the project manager uh, is taking in all the questions. And other than that, we, will, uh, we switch to a, a, a Scrum-based uh, 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 workflow. And that worked a lot better. Uh, we could do Scrum because we didn't have anything in operation uh, in production yet. So until we had stuff in production, we, uh, we, we worked with uh, Scrum uh, sprints, two weekly sprints. And after that, uh, we uh, switched to uh, Kanban. Um, and slowly, things became easier, and people knew where to go with the questions, and the engineers were actually left to do engineering instead of answer uh, scared managers' questions. So that made things a lot nicer. Um, the whole thing was quite a challenge, um, because uh, you're looking at a large traditional enterprise where um, uh, one of the things they did about a decade ago was outsource uh, uh, a lot of stuff to, uh, uh, to a company here in India. And uh, after they did that, they um, kicked out most of the engineering talent in uh, the Netherlands to save cost. Uh, and the result of that was that um, by the time they wanted to implement Puppet, they didn't have any local engineers anymore that uh, could uh, really... Uh, um, do this. So lots of training and lots of uh, uh, hand-holding uh, to get people to understand uh, what they needed to do and what was expected of them. Uh, one of the challenges that was, uh, for me personally, quite uh, annoying was that um, lots and lots and lots of changes in uh, management structure. Um, when we were setting up GitHub Enterprise, I remember having a discussion uh, about names of things. And I said, okay, let's uh, name organizations after uh, teams, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Three people got up and said, no, we're not absolutely not naming anything after anything, uh, because things change faster here than you can ever imagine. So if we name something after uh, team XYZ today, uh, in three weeks that team will disappear because somebody had a change of mind and we will live forever with an organization with a name that doesn't uh, uh, apply anymore. I grudgingly agreed and said, no, it's probably not that bad. And literally three weeks later, uh, they changed a bunch of uh, team names. So uh, we uh, decided to uh, uh, just use counters. Uh, so we had puppet team or customer team 001 uh, as uh, identifiers to ensure that this would actually last until uh, future times. Um, the other thing with management changes is that um, every time uh, somewhere higher up in the uh, management tree something changed, um, we had to deal with uh, uh, someone learning to understand what it is that we're actually doing and why and how. Um, so you know, multiple discussions for no real reason. Uh, in general, I think that in these kind of environments, if you put in a group of uh, skilled engineers, you should trust these engineers to uh, make the right decisions as long as you have set the goals for them uh, clearly. Um, so yeah. 
Um, one of the problems uh, that we had uh, was that there were simply not enough puppet experts in the country to um, help out with this project because simultaneously uh, a large bank in the Netherlands uh, decided to uh, move everything to puppet and somehow the uh, amount of puppet talent is very limited so we ended up uh, or they ended up uh, hiring basically every freelancer and engineer they could find that had ever uh, uh, ran a yum install puppet agent um, so that was a bit of a challenge uh, on top there was a, a an, um, an outsourcing company and they saw this as a great opportunity to have a bunch of people that had never touched puppet to learn puppet and while I am very happy that people are learning a, a new technology doing that in a large production environment where there are already so many uh, unknowns uh, proved to be a bit of a challenge. So we looked at some of the modules that the module team was uh, uh, producing after a while and we, after an hour of crying in a corner uh, we uh, decided to uh, um, do some training and some uh, uh, guidance on how things should be done. Um, so that was definitely a, uh, uh, an interesting challenge. Uh, yeah, I told you the story of the, uh, the guy that ran out of the training and as I did more workshops and, uh, and things to, uh, to get people up to speed, a lot of them had just irrational uh, reasons to not want things. Um, some uh, uh, reasons were actually valid. Um, you have to imagine that some of these uh, guys have been working there for, I don't know, 15 years and Puppet is literally the seventh tool that promises to be the end all of all configuration management problems and so they would just sit there and go yeah it, what you say it sounds all really nice but this company is not a normal company so um, this will be uh, to th this year there is budget and next year there won't be budget so uh, don't get too excited and uh, in the end they proved to be not entirely wrong um, so yeah frustrating um, the future uh, of that uh, project, uh, when I left uh, in uh, December, um, they were at a stage where the first uh, teams were uh, really uh, uh, using Puppet and things slowly started to make sense. Um, but still, you have to imagine that um, a lot of uh, uh, application managers now needed to switch from the mindset of if my customer requests that, I'll open uh, uh, tools, settings, I go to the third tab and I click the fourth check mark and I'm done uh, to a uh, full puppet workflow where uh, uh, they need to go and figure out which uh, setting in code that actually is, especially in Windows, that is uh, uh, definitely a challenge. Once they find that setting, puppetize it, then run it on a test uh, environment, and then finally uh, run it to a production environment. So a lot of their daily tasks just simply got a lot more complicated. On top of that, they needed to learn Git and Puppet and GitHub and uh, Jenkins and all of these things. So it's a, it's a steep uh, uh, learning curve. But um, uh, yeah, uh, my contacts that are still there, they uh, say it's, it's going in the right direction. Uh, so that was it. Oh, I thought they said questions. Um, so um, that was uh, that was my uh, my session. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, uh, speak up. Um, before we start to the questions, uh, th I'm doing a, a workshop, a puppet workshop tomorrow. So uh, um, this is a bit more advanced uh, puppet, so you can see how to do things in a production environment. Um, uh, there are still seats available, so if you're interested, uh, uh, feel free to sign up, and uh, I'll uh, see what I can do with you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, how can we differentiate Puppet from Chef? Ah. How can you differ differentiate Puppet from Chef? So how can you differentiate a Mercedes from a BMW? Mercedes for business class. It's a lame answer, but really uh, both uh, in both cars you can drive and, in, and they have four wheels and a steering wheel, just that the engine is built by other people in a different way. And Puppet and Chef is exactly the same. You can do the same things. They have different bells and whistles. The point is that you should be using one of them or one of the other uh, tools. But in order to, uh, uh, these debates are really difficult. Some people will like a BMW better and some people will like a Mercedes better. And that's totally fine. Um, over here. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how did you solve the uh, storages of passwords, which need to be one way, one way encrypted? Yeah. So that wasn't solved, uh, at least not when I left. Um, the problem is that uh, Puppet and uh, uh, highly sensible da sensitive data is currently an unsolved problem. Uh, there is a, um, a Hira backend that does uh, uh, encryption, um, but uh, Hira eYAML is what it's called. Uh, the problem is that uh, the Puppet master uh, that builds the uh, catalog, the configuration to send over to the agent, retrieves the password from there and decrypts it and then sends it over the wire. So the, 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 the configuration that is sent to the agent is actually uh, uh, plain text passwords. And this is particularly uh, uh, painful with uh, uh, Windows machines that need to join an Active Directory domain, because you need a domain administrator's password uh, in order to get that done. So um, yeah, that was an, uh, an unsolved problem. The uh, uh, so storing of uh, two-way encryption uh, two-way encrypted passwords, uh, we got the uh, security uh, team to uh, adjust the uh, security policy because there is simply no way you can uh, store a password one way encrypted and then hope to use it somewhere else. Thank you. Uh, hey. Yo. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, actually we are spread across multiple data centers. Okay. And we are thinking of uh, a distributed puppet master setup. This is for non-enterprise thingy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what do you suggest about the CA authority in this case? So, how should we go about it? So, uh, your question is you're you're thinking about a, a a puppet setup in a Windows environment and how to go about uh, it. Linux, Windows, both is a mixture. Um, yeah, it really uh, there's a, that's really a, a, a not a simple question. Um, there's a lot of best practices. Uh, I think that maybe we can uh, talk about it after this uh, this talk because I can literally talk for a day, <laughs> three days about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think that if you've already done some puppet, you might want to come to the workshop tomorrow because there I show a whole workflow uh, that that is uh, a good for production level environments, and I could could maybe give you some uh, enlightenment as to how to handle these things. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. So I have a question on the similar lines that uh, puppet, uh, he asked Puppet versus Chef. So I'm asking Puppet versus Ansible. Sorry? Ansible. Yeah, same thing. Uh, do you like, no, well, actually not the same thing. Do you like a BMW or a Mercedes or a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> um, to go a little bit more in depth, uh, there's nothing wrong with Ansible. They just have a, it has a different use case than Puppet. Um, Ansible is a orchestration tool with which you say push this configuration to that machine right now. Um, with Puppet you say I want this machine to stay in this state for a continuous time. So it, the, the idea behind it is different. Um, actually uh, a lot of people are using Ansible uh, together with Puppet. Um, and that's an option. Um, but really it depends. I see that in, in large enterprise environments, Puppet is unbeatable for all the things that it provides. Uh, the reporting and uh, logging and all of these things are, are at the moment unbeatable. Um, Ansible for, uh, let's say, a SaaS uh, uh, environment is a very valid uh, uh, alternative because there you deal with single applications and it's more of, uh, I want to push configurations to these places now. Uh, so it's a, it's a more simple environment. And there, I would even say that Puppet might, uh, might be overkill uh, depending on your environment. OK, thanks. Anyone else going once, going twice? Thank you very much.